I remember being mystified at the revelations of sister's sister liaisons and also feeling I was being plunged into terrain where there were no boundaries. There was something intoxicating about this, and the only intimacy of Bergman's camera and his phenomenal relationship to his actors made this disturbing alchemy work. Those are words from director Adam McGoyan on Ingmar Bergman's 1963 film, The Silence. Seeing Faces in Movies is a podcast for each month I focus on the works of a different director or cinematographer. And each week I invite a guest on to discuss the film and the artist's filmography. I'm your host, Felicia Maroney, and we're talking about the silence today. So a quick synopsis of the film is two estranged sisters, Esther and Anna, and Anna's 10-year-old son travel to the central European country on the verge of war. Esther becomes seriously ill, and the three of them move into a hotel in a small town called Tomoka. Tagline for the film is Bergman at his most powerful, shocking, bold. Film stars Ingrid Thulin as Esther, Gunnar Lindblom as Anna, Jorgen Lindstrom as Johan, and Hakan Janberg as the hotel steward. It's written by Ingmar Bergman, cinematography by Sven Nekvist, directed by Ingmar Bergman, edited by Ulla Reich, and music by Ivan Van Leiden. Today, my guest is Jeff Thomas. I know Jeff through the Royal Film Club. He's someone whose opinion on film I, I really value. And he also runs a film blog where you talk about your memories of cinemas around New York City and the films that you've seen, the people that you've seen them with, and what was going on in your life at that time. It's a blog that I actually read every month. It's not one that I pretend to read. I actively read it because I think you're such a great writer. And I know you're also a photographer. You do a lot of stuff in film, just a well-rounded artist. So Jeff, thank you so much for coming on the show. I, I'm very excited to have you on. Yeah. Thanks for inviting me, Felicia. It's, this is this is cool. <laughs> yeah. I'm excited. I'd love to hear more about the the blog that you're writing. Do you have more plans for it? And then just talk about your other work that you're working on. Yeah. The initial idea for the blog was that it would be 28. I would talk about 28 cinemas. And the films I saw there, so there will be 28 parts, and I'm coming up on 28 this next mm-hmm. week. And the, yeah, the idea was to end it at 28, but I do have like an idea to talk about some cinemas that I've been to around the world and some of those experiences in like a maybe just like one longer form mm-hmm. uh, part or chapter. Like so, like I went to some cinemas when I lived in Amsterdam, so I would talk about that talk about a movie theater in Malaga in, in Spain. I would express my opinion on on the cinema uh, movie theater uh, catastrophe of Los Angeles. Uh, oh, yeah. When I was there. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Just my, the whole idea for this sprung from seeing dilapidated movie theaters uh, and disused mm-hmm. movie theaters in, in LA when I was there a year ago. So I would, I would talk about that a little bit there. I'm not, it's not all bad. Not, you know, I don't paint it in a bad light, but I would, and then some sh- maybe one in Chicago, the music, bo- music box theater is really mm-hmm. great. So I would extend it a little bit, but the, the whole, yeah, the whole idea would be 28. And then I would try to make it into a book. That would be the next phase of that. You should. I think it's really interesting to talk about your relationship to specific cinemas because i feel the same way with different places i've lived and different cinemas that i've gone to because i used to live in in ireland so when i first moved there i didn't know anyone and the first thing i did was buy subscriptions to both of their art house cinemas and then it was like Mm. oh i now have like no money but i just kind of was like well then i'll just live there eventually i did make friends thankfully but I lived there at the beginning because I was like, this is the way for me to get out of the house that I'm living in and just go see stuff. And it's nice to go see films in, you know, cinemas that are not familiar to you. When I was living in Europe, because it's so cheap to travel around there, I would go to a lot of different countries and some of the friends I would go with, I'd be like, yeah, I'm just going to go see a movie. They're like, you're going to see a movie? We're in Spain. And I'm like, yeah, why not? Like, why would you want to sit in the dark? We're in Spain. I'm like, well, it's just two hours of my life. So 
yeah, yeah want to go see a movie. But also, like, if, if you're seeing a movie in a different country that you're not from, chances are you're going to see a local film too. You're going to see yes. what their film industry is like. And they're not, presumably, they're not going to have English subtitles. So you're just going to have to, mm-hmm. like, oh, cool. yeah. yeah. It's, 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 it's fun. so interesting to see the film cultures in different cities. And like, we have our big hubs, like, you know, if you're talking about America where you're living, you know, New York, LA would be big hubs, Chicago also. In Canada, here, Toronto would be a big hub, Montreal and Vancouver. Mm. But then, like, I've been to Portugal a, a few times, and Lisbon has like a huge film uh, museum and theater there. And it's just so beautiful the way they formed it out. And they like are very passionate about film. And like, you wouldn't think about the fact that Lisbon has, and like Porto, another city in Lisbon. Portugal that I've been to that's so artsy. It's like one of the best places I've been to. Glasgow, which is probably my favorite city in the world, has a great cinema there that I've been to several times. I have so many stories about that. So that's why I appreciate the vlog because I'm like, that's such a great way to, you know, just recount your experiences in cinemas because I think it's a special thing. Thanks. I appreciate it. I yeah. will put it in the show notes for people to read, but What I'd like to ask is your relationship to cinema, how, you know, started getting into watching films and when you started noticing that you're like, I want to stray from what's showing in cinemas right now to go back into history and watch stuff. Yeah. I think about, I don't know about you, but I think about this a lot. Oh yeah. I think about, I think like, yeah, like what's your, like people say, what's your story? And it's like, well, my story is when did I stop watching the movies? that were at the local video store or that at, at the multiplex mm-hmm. yeah, and start picking and choosing things that I had no idea what they were and just became more interested in other avant-garde experimental movies uh, mm-hmm. at times. So yeah, we, our family, like we watched a lot of movies growing up. We watched Usual Suspects, right? Mm-hmm. Not the movie, but like the Usual Suspects of, you know, Spielberg, Zemeckis, Coppola, uh, a lot of Disney movies. It was just, we watched a lot of movies. and. It wasn't until I watched Monty Python and the Holy Grail on Comedy Central when I was like 12. Mm-hmm. And the opening <laughs> the opening credits of that movie parodies Bergman films. It's all yep. it's a parody of the opening titles for those. I didn't realize that, but some maybe somehow I figured that out and by watching that I got into <laughs> Bergman. Mm-hmm. The Criterion collection in like 1997, 1998, was very nascent, right? The DVDs, I, they only had a, a, like a hundred, a few hundred out or something like that. It wasn't mm-hmm. obviously as prolific as it is now. And the graphic for the Seven Seal was just, it's the devil on the beach with the cape, right? Very yeah. graphic image. And that, I saw that movie and I bought it sight unseen, but that was like the first film that I watched where I realized film could be art that mm-hmm. it could explore different ideas because i'd seen foreign language films before that mostly from the influence of you know my parents mm-hmm. and you know when my dad found out that i was interested in movies that i was interested in writing he was like oh you should watch citizen kane and so we watched citizen kane when i was like you know 11 or something i was like okay this is this is good this is entertaining they said, you should watch 2001 A Space Odyssey. But they didn't. And I watched that. Uh, I wouldn't recommend reading the script and watching the movie at the same time because it didn't make it, 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 <laughs> any sense. <laughs> for any movie but or 2001? Specifically for 2001. Yeah. Okay. It, it was very strange to try and follow. <laughs> but those two, like, I, I bring that up only because those two movies would be, oh, well, if you saw those two movies, that would catapult you into a whole other stratosphere of, of films, right? Yeah. Presumably. Now that I've seen that, I've graduated into something else. But they didn't really have that big of an impact on me. It wasn't until Seventh Seal that I was like, oh, wow, this is this is something different. I don't understand it, but I, I'm going to keep watching it until I do. Mm-hmm. I like the mood that it puts me in. Mm-hmm. And from there, I was like, okay, so Criterion, what's Criterion? And so yeah. I had a friend who, yeah, I had a friend who knew what Criterion was and he was kind of 
if I was into the art house European cinema, he was into the uh, exploitation kind of, it, it, you know, if, if I liked Seven Seal, he liked the X-rated RoboCop uh, release, yeah. right? He was, he was that kind of guy. But we, we still, uh, it was still a good resource, right? And so from there, all, th- all throughout my teens, I, I watched a lot of Bergman. And then I found Tarkovsky. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, so we really, like, through high school, I didn't tell any of my friends that I was watching these movies either. It was like I was the only person, especially where I came from in St. Paul, Minnesota. There wasn't a big film culture. It was a, it was a music city. You know, it was this it was oh, the okay. city. Of, it's the, you know, Minneapolis, St. Paul. It was the city of Prince, the city of uh, Husker oh. Du. It was much more into music than, than, than film. So I just had the public library. Mm-hmm. What one like art house video store that I ransacked basically. Uh, those are my two options at the time. And yeah, from it just kind of ac- accelerated and I made a list. I made myself mm-hmm. a, a, a list of all the directors, uh, you know, 16 year old Jeff, you know, making a list of, okay, I need to see music. Gucci. I need to see uh, Bresson. I need to see all these movies. Yep. And yeah, it was just, it gave me something more than what was, I guess in the late nineties, early two thousands, what was, was present. I think that's great. A lot of what you said is kind of mirrors my foray into film. Like both of my parents are huge movie nerds, but in a different way from each other, a different way from myself. And for me, it's funny because I'll talk to people and they'll talk about the show too. And they're like, Oh, you're tackling like, you know, the big ones and it's like it's like really important films and i'm like yeah but i like a lot of films and these are just the mm. directors that stand out to me right off the bat but i grew up in such a movie house still both my parents are voracious movie watchers like i grew up watching a bunch of westerns and like kung fu movies and action movies and it's just that and my siblings are also really big into movies it's just that i took it to the next level because of my personality where i was like oh this is my thing i'm now gonna go to school to for this for as opposed like my siblings were like i like films but i it's not my entire life which is totally fair i still make lists of being like oh this is director i need to finish off their filmography let me write all the films that i haven't seen but like um i think there's like a gateway thing where you start getting into film like for me in high school i had a friend katie who she and i were very close and we were really into movies and we tried to find the most fucked up horror movies to watch and when you do that you go back decades and decades and then i was like oh this is my thing i like being back in the 60s 70s what else can i find and all of a sudden it's like now fast forward 10 years later it's like oh my favorite genres are like film noir, westerns of like the thirties, forties, fifties. Yeah, it always change. It always evolves and changes, right? Mm-hmm. As it should. I'm always interested to find out how people are like. Oh, this is something I actually want to explore, as opposed to just oh, I'm gonna go see the latest movie, which is totally fine, but maybe not the way I live my life. But I'm also really bad at watching new movies. But you talked about Bergman, how you got into his work. Do you remember the first time you watched this film, The Silence? Yeah, a month ago. <laughs> was it? It was, yeah. Like, oh, I thought you'd seen on, it before. Okay. I, I'd never seen this movie before. Oh, that's uh, great. It's, it's, yeah. It's odd because, like, I've seen kind of the, the you know, the heavy hitters, right? The, mm-hmm. the, the most well known Bergman films. Yeah. But I could, maybe it, it was just like his films put me in such a place, in a mood. That I, I was like, okay, that's enough. Like he's made seventy more yeah. of these. Like, but it was also like I maybe I knew instinctively. Okay, maybe I'm not ready to watch scenes from a marriage yet. Maybe I'm not ready yeah. to watch Autumn Sonata. Like I, I, I think I'm like mm-hmm. okay. I understand what's there. I'm just not ready for it yet. Yeah, I'd seen Wild Strawberries, mm-hmm. Cries and Whispers, Virgin Spring, and kind of petered out for a while. And Persona. I always forget that I've seen Persona just because it's kind of a fever dream of a movie. Yeah. <laughs> this film, yeah, I'd only seen it recently. And before I'd seen it, I I was always aware of it. I was aware of the Criterion trilogy that they came out with in 
2003 with uh, Through Glass Darkly, Winter Light, and then Silence. But yep. I think I didn't watch it just because of the subject of God and, and religion. And it kind of turned yeah. me off initially. But I did. Yeah. That's, that's a whole I other. also don't like that's not my it's weird because Bergman is like my one of my top people and he tackles that a lot. Mm. But the way I read it is him questioning it. And it's like as someone who unfortunately had to go to Catholic school, uh, but does not identify as a Catholic. It spoke to me in that way where I was like, OK, this is me being like, I'm rejecting this. <laughs> and I think he. He's grappling with, should I reject it or is this my life? That's true. Yeah, he is definitely questioning it rather than idolizing it or anything mm-hmm. like that. Yeah, I, so I did watch Through a Glass Darkly and Winter Light before I saw uh, The Silence. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the evolution of those two films into the third is very strange. It starts pretty f- fairly literal and then it just becomes more abstract. I think that's the beauty of his, his work and I totally understand because I have a people in my life who are like i can appreciate bergman for what he's offered but his work is not my thing and i think that's totally fair there's just something for me i think when i got into him i think you were saying monty python got you into bergman for me it was woody allen when i talk about woody allen i talk about him as uh, a writer and artist who is the reason why i went to film school and was interested in writing he's it's weird to say, but he's is the the reason why, and because his interest in people like Bergman, Fellini, and so on, and all those European directors is how I ventured off, and even his interest in like Russian literature is the reason why I was like in film school. But I also had like a somewhat minor in Russian literature, and all my friends were like, "Why are you doing this to yourself? We have enough reading to do. You now have to read like." a 400 page Dostoevsky book but it's just like you have that one artist who kind of ventures you out and sometimes you enjoy the other artists that inspire them more but for Bergman it was like he kind of spoke to me I was very much sad girl teenager so I was like yeah this is up my alley but I get if it's not for everything because his stuff is pretty heavy I will say though he is heavy but he's very succinct like his stuff for is like 90 minutes yeah, I was going to say that. You're like, he's consistently like, if you know, you can be depressed for 90 minutes, you know? Yeah. You can, uh, <laughs> he doesn't languish on it for too long. No, um, no. It always moves. And I've never seen any of his comedies, but I have mm-hmm. heard that it's they're not great. I've seen almost everything at this point. There's like still a, stra- a few stragglers I need to get around to, but I've seen almost everything. His comedies, it's weird because I feel like his comedies are, especially if you're now watching them, everyone struggles or goes towards his stuff that's not comedy. So when you eventually are like, okay, I'm ready. It's just weird because it's tonally weird where you're like, does this man understand comedy? And I think he does. It's just a very dark, weird comedy. Some of them is, some of them are good. And some of them I'm like, this is, this is not working. <laughs> so it's not like an alternative. Well, if you don't like dark bird, no, you can no. Go for light- no, 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 no. I wouldn't say that. If you don't like Dark Bergman, I would just say that's not for you then. I think yeah. comedy Bergman, comedy in quotes, air quotes, is uh, for the hardcore Bergman fans who are like, okay, I'm willing to <laughs> venture outside. Comedy is not his his uh, strong suit. So it's interesting that you picked The Silence. I hadn't seen it since, and it makes me sound like precocious, but I because I was just that person and... When you start university, you're a teenager. So I would have watched them as a teenager and I hadn't seen it in so long. And I didn't remember most of it other than like the train scene. Uh, mm. And it, it hit me differently as like an adult woman, this film. So I'm excited to get into it if you're ready. Yeah. One of the first points I wanted to cover was kind of the shifting of perspectives. So we have three characters that we're following. We have Johan, who's the young boy. With Anna, who's Johan's mother, and Esther, uh, who is Johan's aunt and Anna's sister. So we're shifting perspectives between the three of them. And we're following their stories for however long they're kind of traveling on the train to the hotel and their time spent there. And then they eventually leave. I like the 
changing in perspectives because we get three very distinct perspectives. The way I view Johan is he's the innocence in this story. He's the one who's marveling at the world because he's so young. Everything is new to him. We have Anna, who is a young mother. She obviously is a single mother. The father is not around for whatever reason, and she's dealing with her sexuality and and the liberation of her sexuality. And as a mother, which is a whole huge topic there. And then we have Esther, who's clearly unwell, and she's grappling with that. She's Mm. dealing with alcoholism, sexual frustration, and she has this illness, which is, is up for debate if she's kind of making it up or she just is so mentally unwell that she's made herself physically unwell so how do you feel about the shifting of perspectives and how it goes uh from one person to the next and switches back and forth in such a short time frame do you find it overwhelming or do you think that he did it in a way to kind of give you well-rounded characters yeah i i don't think the shifts are overwhelming they're very subtle Mm -hmm. i think it has a lot to do with the lack of a music score yeah, a lot of the sounds are, uh, you know, diegetic sounds and natural sounds from the city. And so I did rewatch it, and the second time I was, I, I watched it. Like even the shifts in perspective from Johan, mm-hmm. everything from his point of view is enlarged and massive and grotesque. And the 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 butler looks like a ghoul, you know, and yeah. and everything is framed just strange strangely uh everything's kind of enlarged right and he looks at uh esther when she's sleeping and she's snoring but it looks like she's she looks like a you know sleeping volcano or something and her her hand on the the bed is just enormous and everything looks strange to this kid he is an innocent and i'm glad that he was protected during this movie because there was yeah definitely some parts of this movie that could have gone a very the virgin spring route right yeah Uh, and but then and then the the shift in perspective to anna Mm -hmm. is also equally surreal because when she's walking around it's just like she's the only woman in a sea of men like Mm -hmm. and 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 it's very intimate from her perspective and it's very sensual and esther is just this kind of rocky uh it's it's the complete opposite of of, of, of anna and mm-hmm. i don't think she's making it is you could question whether or not she's making up the illness mm-hmm. other than the fact that she coughs up blood at the beginning uh into her you know handkerchief so in her in her perspective the yeah the, the lighting is just, is sharp and and mm-hmm. angular and it's not pleasant <laughs> No. <laughs> like being her is not like she just goes up and down these these uh where, where she's just she's dying one second and then she takes a few more drinks and then she's fine mm-hmm. so those three perspectives shifting like that it's very organic i think for me first and foremost he is a great storyteller and i think he knows how to formulate a story and it's wild to me that someone could create that many stories because he has like an insane filmography. It's not like he just made 10 films. It's like, it's a lot. And for him to have written all these works and create all these characters. And obviously there's overlap because his themes that he likes to explore, which is totally fair. I think that's, if that's what you like, write What you know, what you're into, but with the silence, it just hit me in a different way. And sometimes that's what I like about films as someone I'm sure with yourself who watches a lot of films, I don't often rewatch a lot because I'm just so into watching as many films as I can. But I think with someone like a director who has a great effect on you, like for me with Bergman, it's interesting to watch his films like as a a teenager and then in your 20s and then your 30s and so on and Mm -hmm. see you're like, oh, I identify with this person now or I understand this person. Whereas I pretty sure I didn't understand anything of what was going on the first time I watched this. And now I'm like, oh, I can see both Anna and Esther's perspective, <laughs> um, which leads me into like the concept of a man writing about female 
uh, sexuality. And I think that people might disagree. I think he does a great job when he does it because I think he's honest. Some people might think it's a little bit brutal and it's kind of cartoonish of like a woman who's using sex to deal with things and a woman who's using alcohol and the sexual frustration. But I'm like, mm, I could definitely see myself in both of these people. So we have Anna, who's a mother, and she's, like I said, single mother, a young boy, and she's seen walking around, essentially cruising. She's not actively cruising, but she's like, if, you know, someone catches my eye, why not? And then we have Esther, who's confined to a bed most of the time. And we have the masturbation scene. So if we want to talk about Anna, I guess, first. And I always like kind of talking about these female-centric movies with men. (laughs) I like actively do that because it's easier to to talk to a woman because we're just going to usually agree. Not always, but... It's interesting to get the male perspective of of this, especially because it's a male director. So I'm glad that you picked this. But Anna, as a mother who, as a young boy, is traveling around, and I don't see him as judging her. I think that it's totally valid, and I am pro exploring your sexuality as a mother. How do you think that he handled her character and you know her eventual break with her? Her sister, Anna, mm-hmm. with Anna. yeah, I, I mean, she starts off. I mean, in in the so, in the theater scene uh, mm-hmm. where that cup where the couple is, well, I guess rewind when she's at the when she's at the cafe, and she's just reading the n- newspaper that she can't read. I don't think she's nec- I, I I got the sense that she wasn't necessarily looking for anything, but she was the only woman in there, so yeah. Maybe she just was like unconsciously doing this, and the 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 you know the waiter just flagrantly <laughs> picks her up. Mm-hmm. Uh, so maybe that gives her a, a, a sense. Okay, maybe I can do this. Maybe this is yeah. something that's possible here. And be, and then when she gets into the the theater, she's initially shocked. That's shocked by the like the sexual explicit nature of this couple se- seated next to her, mm-hmm. like. She's shocked and she wants to, she's repelled by it, which I was kind of taken aback. I was like, but I thought like you were the more like sensual um, Mm -hmm. person of the two. Yeah. I think that just gives her more uh, agency and more license to, to explore like what you're saying. Like she's obviously separated from her husband. Something's going on. Something has gone on with her sister that we find Mm -hmm. out later. And I don't, yeah, I don't think Bergman is is really judging her based on what she's doing, and I think it would be reductive to generalize uh, or stereotype each of the characters as representing one thing or another, mm-hmm. like representing an idea or like the ego and the id or or yeah the f- the flesh and 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 the the intellect and 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 the eyes or or whatever but obviously she uses her sexuality in a painful way too she uses it to hurt her sister because she knows that what she does is going to affect her a lot more than this guy mm-hmm. like she doesn't care about the guy he's just some yeah. guy they, can't, they don't even speak the same language and they can't uh communicate in that way so she yes yeah, she uses it as a weapon towards the end to her strength and I think she regrets it too. I think yeah. uh, she regret hurting her sister. The, the strange thing about this movie is like, it's, it's, it's hard to articulate it. I'm finding it hard to articulate because it's quiet and it's, it's mm-hmm. almost all visuals. And so it's yeah. a very visual film and it's very sensorial. Is that the right word? It's like, it's very sensual, meaning that it's a movie that you can feel, mm-hmm. right? You feel the emotions, you feel the action, you feel, you're putting the point of view of every one of these characters. So now I have to interpret from their point of view, what's happening, which is a great thing to empathize with somebody that I, I am not, but yeah, Bergman has always written uh, women characters mm-hmm. and he was, he was prolific at it. And I would assume that he did a good job at it because uh you know all his his uh, cast of uh, his troop 
mm-hmm. kept coming back and and uh, kept performing these uh, characters that were completely, you know, fallible and nuanced and weren't perfect, but were sometimes they were fresh, sometimes they were stinky, sometimes mm-hmm. they were evil, sometimes they were completely gentle, like a person, you know. Yeah. I did read that he initially started to write this for men, these characters of uh, Esther and Anna for men, but he changed it because he was afraid that it was too close to him, himself, yeah. the characterization. I, I've, I completely understand that. I've done that in my writing. I've been like, oh, this shows too, this is too emotionally raw for, yeah. for it to be considered a male protagonist. How, you know, maybe because men aren't typically uh, exploring mm-hmm. their emotions in, in stories. Yeah, it's a, whole, it's, it's a whole different dynamic. So there's a lot of fluctuations with, with these characters. I'm glad that you brought up, you know, his exploration of those feelings and writing those feelings through a woman, because the last two directors I would have covered now before the Bergman month uh, would have been Brian De Palma and then Cassavetes. All three mm. of these directors are very well known for writing women characters in very different ways. But I think they're all exploring their feelings and being like, it's easier to do it. I don't know if easier is the right word, but uh, I can get my point across a lot more if I do it through a female character because it's easier to show a woman feeling these feelings, which is totally valid. And I think that these men are very good at writing women characters in their own ways. Some people may disagree. You know, everyone has their thoughts about De Palma and women, Cassavetes and women, and even Bergman and women. But these are all people who are quite well known for writing their female characters and all their biggest movies are female centric. And when they go to write men, that's when it's like, oh, this is that one off one that may not have worked. Bergman has maybe one or two that are like male centric that are well known, something like a seven seal. His bigger ones like this, Cries and Whispers, Persona. They're all, you know, the women, even scenes from a marriage. You're, we're talking about Liv Ullman. We're not really talking about the male character as much when we're talking about those films. And whenever he does have male characters that he can really put in the forefront, they're often children. So we see that in like a Fanny and Alexander, because I think he reverts back to his childhood in that. Not to get super Freudian about it, <laughs> but... I think your points about Anna are super valid. And that brings us kind of to Esther, who is going on with her own stuff there. So there's a couple dynamics I want to talk about. There's Esther and herself. There's Esther and Anna. And there's Esther and Johan, which is probably the least important if we have to grade it. Esther and Johan, they're aunt and nephew, but there's a lack of warmth be- be- between them. I think she's trying and he's trying, but there's like a disconnect there where it's just like this awkward tension. And it probably relates to their relationship with he knows that his mother is not super close with his sister. And that's translating. And there's also the battles between Esther and herself uh, that she is dealing with through alcohol. She's dealing with through kind of shutting herself off. And I think it's not even just a a woman thing this is just a thing that any human being who's dealt with depression can handle or understand how do you feel about the kind of portrayal of esther and she's probably the most overtly complex i think anna's still very complex even you is but esther is the more in your face complex because she's going through it yeah oh you know she might be going through an exorcism you know throughout the movie yeah uh <laughs> <laughs> and she's 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 the one who's really uh self-reflexive i, I wrote down something so she said i used to be a level-headed person and she was like oh i'm so this is humiliating i i mm-hmm. can't believe it's all this talk uh, you know that she knows that she's driving herself into her own death yeah it, her relationship with johan is is strange because every time she wants to touch his face and be gentle uh approachable to, he kind of just yeah know, scoffs and just uh, no don't touch me you know it's very subtle but it's very off-putting 
especially mm-hmm. when it's repeated. Esther's the big sister, right? She's she's the older yeah. one. So there's that dynamic uh, mm-hmm. uh, going on. Yeah, there's a, there's a par- power hier- hierarchy in, in siblings, no matter how, if you ignore it or not, it's always there. And she talks about her father, her 400 pound father, and they never mention their mother until she's convulsing in her bed at the end. I took that as a key of maybe because they don't talk about God. They don't talk about the, the movie to the silence of God or the, the absence mm-hmm. of God. Maybe mother is, is their God that, that they're, you know, um, appeasing to uh, at the end relation. So her relationship with her sister, you know, it's fraught. It's she's always spying on her. She's always kind of suspicious of her. She's always judging her, even though uh, Anna, I, I wouldn't say she loves her. I wouldn't there. They're, they're, she's, taking care of her for sure. Mm-hmm. Uh, she kind of doesn't believe her disease is legitimate. Uh, she thinks she's just, you know, like a toddler, maybe uh, yeah, kicking up uh, some noise to get attention. It seems that she's kind of truly happy when she's, when she's translating, when she's writing and when she's drunk uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, for a time. And so how I said uh, Anna uh, uses her sexuality to hurt her sister by like when she is kissing uh, this man just to to show off, like, you can't have me, like, you can't yeah. have this. Uh, Esther then uses her intellect. She then uses her, her words to play down, to diminish everything that Anna has been doing and therefore hurts Anna. Like... Mm-hmm. So I'm talking about the scene towards the end where uh, Esther is standing outside the bedroom door and you hear her yeah. crying. Yeah. Right. And it's weird how it bookends that the scene starts with her, Esther crying at the, at the beginning and then mm-hmm. Anna crying at the end. Esther is like at the end of that scene is totally, I guess the look on her face is just relief. Like mm. maybe exhaustion. I don't know. It's the, I guess I'm not, I'm not cutting through. There is sexual tension there, right? I'm not cutting through some of the nuance of this. There, Esther loves Anna. She yeah. wants Anna. Yeah. She wants, she wants her. She wants to mm-hmm. kiss her. She wants her body. She wants, yep. <laughs> like, it, we she do makes get that, that one scene. Yeah. We do yeah. get a clear scene where you're like, oh no, I hope he's not going to go down the incest uh, venue. And he doesn't, but he's definitely, it's like on the brink where you're like, "Uh uh-oh, what's happening here? It's there. But that's what is so great about this is that he just gives you little, just little bits Mm -hmm. of information that your mind goes to this, to the verge. And you're like, maybe, maybe not. And then he puts that in there. Like, oh no, she's actually like necking her. You know, he's actually, she's actually pecking at her cheeks and it's like, oh, okay. So it, that's, we can't ignore that. And every, so every action and every reaction has to be rethought because now you're like, okay, this is someone who's can't have what's right in front of them. You know, mm-hmm. this is someone that whose desires cannot be fulfilled just through their art. And it's, she has to get drunk and she has to masturbate. And I, so I thought pretty quickly that, that you know, uh, <laughs> The way that uh, Sven Nikvis, the cinematographer, shoots her when mm-hmm. she's supposedly in passion looks kind of horrific. It doesn't, you know, for something that's 90 minutes, that they're, they're able to make, yeah, they're able to tell a story visually so succinctly. I think you said it before. Like, I think that's why he's a master. I, and I don't have problems with longer film. Although sometimes I do. And it's like, you haven't merited me sitting here for three hours if you're just kind of not getting to the point, circling around. Bergman has so much in there. And sometimes a shorter film with so much information can feel like an overload. And you're like, this is too much. I needed this to be stretched out. But he's such a great storyteller. Mm-hmm. And with Sven, who is definitely a DOP that I'm going to cover on the show because I absolutely obsessed with his work. I'm glad that you yeah. brought up that scene because I wanted to bring it up. In fact, that this is what a film that kind of got through the censors oddly enough in Sweden. And obviously we know that European films had a different censor than North American films. So they were allowed to do more, but this still was one that kind of slipped through the cracks uh, of the censors of having 
that scene of a woman masturbating, which is not a scene we still don't really get that today, despite the fact that it's very much a thing. And it's or it's comedic. If it's done, it's comedically. It's that it's done in a comedy uh, sort of way, and as opposed to this is like a a moment in her life where she needs a release, and that's why she's doing it. And I think that's why it's shot in such a sort of like dark and way, as opposed to it's not sexy at all. You're not supposed to be turned on by the scene. It's a woman who is so fraught and so filled with tension that she needs a release. And I think a lot of women can identify with that scene. A lot of people can identify with that scene, but it's not often seen with women, even with men. I don't think we get a lot of masturbation scenes that are not supposed to be like funny or really dark. The only one I can think of that's like a really weird and dark one was I cover in trouble every day and we get a Vincent Gallo one that's like uh, dark. (laughs) We're like, oh, we're really going there, but that's, Kathini also that's a woman dealing with this. I really I think that scene, as odd as it is to say, is probably my favorite because it's not something you see often. And I think it's just so honest in the way it was shot and uh done. And it's very quick, but it stuck with me. And I think it's kind of basically the thesis to Esther. It's what she is. That scene is her needing having all this bubbling tension and anger in her and she needs to find a way to release it's either that it's alcohol it's sitting in bed crying to be deal because she doesn't know how to deal with real life the title of the film the silence there's a lot of silence in this film it starts off with a lengthy train scene a lot of silence between the three characters that we get it also ends with the train scene and there's a quite a bit of silence there but there's a lot of silence throughout the film because it's a very visual film as you said we're following these people and that kind of translates to the loneliness that all these characters feel and we're getting from all of them did you feel how do you feel about the the way loneliness is portrayed between the three of them because they're all lonely in their own specific way and they're dealing with it in different ways johan's dealing with it in his own way and it seems less sad than the other two women, but he's still lonely, right? Yeah, I mean the whole film is lonely, right? Because they're mm-hmm. in a they're in a foreign land that they don't that's completely mm-hmm. uh, unfamiliar. Yeah, unfamiliar. It's they don't speak the language. They uh, Esther specifically never leaves her room. She never leaves yeah. the the uh, uh, hotel. The hotel seems like it's abandoned. The, the the hallways are empty. The lights are off. Mm-hmm. Uh, the city itself is being abandoned. It's it, it's becoming more lonelier. Like mm-hmm. Johan is lonely because he just keeps getting shuffled between you know one parent to another parent. I'm I'm mm-hmm. saying Esther's also a parent. You know uh, mm-hmm. between the two the two women, and he spends a lot of his time like. Danny and The Shining just running around the halls yeah. of mm-hmm. an, an abandoned, you know, dilapidated, decaying hotel. And he tries to find some some company, but it's always it's always dangerous. That's what I, that's how I perceived it. It's like oh, this is every with the little people, the circus performers. Mm-hmm who I'm stumbling because I don't know how to, it's like they, uh, so one of them is dressed up as a, as a monkey and he's basically humping the bed. Yeah. And they dressed Johan up in a dress to say, Hey, look what we're going to do to you. And yeah, it's, that's the in, in, inference there. And luckily it stops. And then he goes to the Butler who kind of scares him, you know, and then he's, playing around with a, a hot dog with a wiener in, in a, a folded up lettuce. And it's just like, what, what are you doing? Like Man. he can't, he can't find anybody and he's always in the shadows. He may have some escape. No, he, he does have an escape through drawing. That's his release. Mm-hmm. Right. And Anna is lonely. See, th- this is, th- this is what I love about Bergman is, is all of his films are extremely visual, but they're so psychological. They're it's it's yeah. very complex. It's seemingly not complex, but the more you detail what is actually happening and the plot points and the beats of everything and 
what how one reaction goes to another it's like oh no this is it goes a little bit deeper than mm. just from the surface and i i don't know why she is lonely it, i mean it could have to do with her, her, her reaction to her sister it could be she resents being a mother it could be she resents yeah. that she she is able to exercise her own sexuality now because she has someone else to look after her child but is her loneliness that is it is it uh, lost youth is it you know uh, being in a, a foreign land that well, maybe that's not being so lonely because she finds some company uh, uh-huh. you know it could be all those things uh and it's really like what i'm bringing to it rather than what's explicitly being signified to me through the actions yeah. and uh esther's lonely because maybe you know maybe she bear- she carries the burden of the of of, of a family somehow you know, being the oldest sibling, and both her parents are are dead, and mm-hmm. it's it, it maybe she yeah she's she's carrying all of that, and she's uh, lonely because you know her loneliness is being personified through her sickness. I, I think. Mm-hmm. What, do you, what do you what do you think? I think so. I think I agree with all those things. Uh, if we bring it back to Johan, I also was kind of nervous around him just kind of exploring the hotel. And I definitely was like, there's no way Kubrick didn't see this. And was like, ah, I'm transporting this to The Shining because it was so much Danny in The Shining, uh, which yeah. is fine. Like, I am all for that. But it's weird because I think that the hotel attendant was such an interesting character to me because he's so visually interesting and he was so intertwined in their lives at their moment there. But he was mm-hmm. kind of weird and creepy. And I was hoping that he wasn't like actually creepy. It was just that he was also lonely and just wanted to entertain Johan. I think that's what it was. I think it was that. Yeah. As opposed to him being a predator. Well, now that you bring that up, he after he chomps at the at the wiener with inside mm-hmm. the, the lettuce or the cabbage, he shows him these photos. And I'm mm-hmm. thinking, oh, great. He's going to show him like nudie photos or something. Yeah. Gross. But no, it's like, it's, it's his family. It's, mm-hmm. he points, it's his dead. It looked like his dead wife, like mm-hmm. somebody in a coffin. Right. And they're all standing around the coffin. Then he flips to the, the next photo and it's like, this is me. And, it, and it, I think it's like, he's trying to connect with, with him by showing him, this is me when I was a child, just like yeah. you are now. And then that makes him that makes him even lonelier, you know, yeah. because he's all, now he's thinking of that. And I like that dynamic between him and the hotel attendant because I think once I finally realized, okay, this guy doesn't mean any sort of harm to Johan, and he just is kind of lonely and just wants to connect with this kid. Because what there's a scene where Johan. Uh, comes across the hotel attendant and he's just kind of sitting in a room staring off into the space and we see like the board of like obviously the that's where if someone's calling him from a room it would sort of flash type of deal and he's just kind of sitting there waiting for someone to need him and it's very lonely and you see Johan looking at him and they kind of notice each other and there's like a spark in his eyes where he's like oh I have someone to keep me company. I think it's really good the way he tackled that. It's there's that weird tension just as a human being where you're like, uh, I hope this doesn't go in a dark way. And thankfully it right. didn't. But with Anna, I think it definitely directly kind of ties to her being a mother. And she's obviously a young enough mother because I don't know how old Johan is. I'm very bad at being able to gauge kids <laughs> ages. I see him. He's like 10 and she looks like she's in her mid early mid 30s so she would have had her at him in her 20s so it's like she's just had to live that life and she's now being like he's old enough where i can go out and live my life again and i think that's the she's now having to do it over again because there's no whoever she had the kid with is not there so she's like i now need to Am I still attractive enough to just walk around and get someone is someone gonna pay attention to me and I don't think she's looking for relationships. She's just looking for the physical attention from someone. And with Esther, she's just so wrapped up in things. And it, I think it definitely directly ties to her being the eldest sibling as someone who's also the eldest sibling and having that dynamic with a sister. 
no matter whether my sister and I get along, there's always that weird competition thing. It usually stems from the younger sibling who's trying to compete with the older one. There's always that tension. It doesn't feel forced. It doesn't feel like he's trying to create drama between them because it's they're not like overtly yelling at each other, fighting all the time, which I think is yeah. what makes it work. It'd be different if they were fighting and yelling all the time, but they're not. They do eventually have a blow up. There's like that loneliness that runs through basically everyone through this. And I think the hotel setting is what makes it perfect because you're not in your own environment. So it makes it so even more apparent that these people are lonely. I don't know if you want to talk about it a little bit more about like kind of the hotel itself, because you kind of touched upon about how it kind of seems a bit abandoned and uh, because there's stuff going on in the city. It seems to be like a war going around on and they're traveling through. We don't really know where they are because they don't speak the language and there's specifically no subtitles during those scenes. And we kind of come across a cast of minimal characters that are living there. So how do you feel about that setting? It's the hotel itself feels, I know it sounds naive coming from an American, but it it, it looks old world, right? You know, mm-hmm. it looks it looks a bit like a fairy tale. It bit it looks. <laughs> I hate saying this, but it reminded me of Grand Budapest Hotel, and just like yeah, because I've never, oh, yeah, because nice. I've never been to one of those those types mm-hmm. of hotels before. The concept that there's a war happening or there's an oncoming war mm-hmm. happening, it has to symbolize something. It's not just there for nothing, but what it does symbolize, I don't know. I mean, <laughs> it. <laughs> It could be yeah. it could it could be sexual with the you know the tanks and the explosions and the sirens and the noise and the trembling and the rumbling. It could be a, an extension of what's happening, you know, in their interior lives going on in the exterior. It could be that right, and then you see these. Every time Esther looks out, there's a man driving a, a, an emaciated horse mm-hmm. through through the main street uh, and shuffling and moving old furniture. And I'm watching that thinking, okay, are those dead bodies? Like, it, is it like, that's what I saw. I was like, those are the dead bodies. Those are, yeah. it's maybe she doesn't want to see the dead bodies. Maybe it's, you know, it'd be the same as if it was, it was a cart full of shoes, you know, it, mm-hmm. it those the chair chairs and tables and that, that represents people. It represents what's missing from, from what usually inhabits those, you know those are articles. Yeah, I wonder why he chose to use a, a fictitious city. Maybe because then we wouldn't have to focus on okay, how does this, how does this, what puzzle piece does this fit into politically in the mm-hmm. geography of Europe, right? So we don't we don't even have to think about okay, po- politically, what does this mean? Because it's just it's a generalization of Eastern European war zones. Mm-hmm. And that's br- that's I think that's a brilliant choice because it, yeah. it presents you with with yeah with the idea that you are familiar with but you don't need to specify. He very rarely shot films that took place outside of Sweden, so I think this is very purposeful. Why it's outside of the character's homeland, his own homeland of just being like, I don't need to tell you where they're going, but they're escaping from something. They're going towards a new life. And this is what they're dealing with in the meantime. Because if they were in their own home in Sweden, you might just be like, why is it that they can't just, you know, go out and see their friends, go out and do this, go out to their familiar places that they would might maybe go because they don't know these places. They don't, we don't know where they are. It's just a stopping point, clearly, because then they get on the train again or Anna and Johan get on the train again to leave uh, because she's bringing him to her mother's place for her to take care of him. Oh, the mother's alive. I, I, I kept saying earlier that the mother was dead, but no, they're going to grandma's house. That's, that's what she said, right? Yeah. Or, I think I see Johan the father said. said that they're going to the grandmother's house. Right. Because I guess he's going to be going to school in that town. And it's essentially Somebody that Anna her. can't take care of him alone. So she needs the extra help, which is fair. Yeah. He shot in Pharaoh, right? Hit the island that he lived on. Mm-hmm. That's my it, goal it, it, to go there. To go there, because <laughs> I'm like one of those nerds who. And um, did you see Bergman Island? The film I really want to. I really want to see that. I haven't seen. I it think yet, if you so. if you're a Bergman fan, Hanson Lowe. 
Yeah, I saw that at TIFF, and I loved it. I also am a huge Tim Roth fan. It's just, it's so good. It's very much services towards people who are Bergman fans. Like, I don't think if you're a Bergman fan, you're not going to get much out of it, to be honest. There's a good story behind it. Like, you could enjoy it. But I think if you're a fan of Bergman, it's, like, essentially for you. So I loved it. Nice. That's a side note. Or I guess there's also Bergman's Island, like the documentary that was oh, made. The documentary. Yeah, that is also good. But it's also like you have to have seen his work for you to get anything out of it. It's just like this old man talking about his home and his work and where he screened yeah. his films and stuff like that. Are there any other points of the film that you have in your notes that you want to talk about that we haven't chatted about? The ticking clock, the ticking clock that plays over the credits and mm. then it shows okay. up like two or three more times in, in the film. It's the only sound that's not coming from a radio, not coming from, mm -hmm. uh, how, how do you interpret that? The butler is winding his clock toward, when it shows up at the end, it's the butler winding the, his uh, mm -hmm. clock on a chain, whatever, whatever those are called. How do you interpret that? I think it ties directly into the title of the silence if we're going to be literal about it it's like there's so much silence around that it's either something like a ticking clock that you're going to hear or like a dripping faucet type of deal of like that and i think it's the signs of hearing things that you wouldn't typically hear and that kind of pushing the story forward and being like oh we're on a time constraint here they only have minimal amount of time in this hotel it's a stopping point this is their time there they're trying to make the most out of that time in their own sort of way and it also signals the fact that this is a very short amount of time in those people's lives that we're seeing we don't know what happened to them before we don't know what happens to them after it's not important we're just in this single time frame and it's signaling this is the start of that time this is the end of that time that we get that's how I read it, at least. I don't know how you read it. So, uh, similarly, I, I, I was acknowledging the passage of time mm -hmm. th through the ticking of the clock and how fast it, how fast it was going. The, now that you, you the, how you explained it made me feel kind of thick because I'm like, oh, well, duh. It is. It's exactly what you're saying. It's the. It's pretty. It's fairly one of the more more literal metaphors of the film, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. But, I think I was like, well, oh, maybe it has something to do with the some of the, whoever is wearing the the watches. The uh, well, that too. Of, it's, no, it's up to interpretation. So <laughs> it was it was one of the few motifs in the movie. Yeah, repeated motifs. Yeah, I I am glad that you brought that up. There's a couple things that you see throughout his work that are motifs that he uses quite regularly. The last one that I wanted to bring up. There's a shot of Anna and Esther, and I think it was most popularly known from persona because of the poster of like their faces and the way they're framed but we see it in this movie and this movie is before persona and it's something he's mm -hmm. been doing it's just that persona because it's essentially just two women talking the entire movie i think that's why it's so wildly known from that but he's been doing that and the framing in this movie it's just so beautiful the way he frames things we're often seeing people through things in the hotel and just the way, like, even, like, a hand touching the radio and seeing that as people are talking. But the way he frames faces is always stuck out to me. And I'd forgotten that there is that scene in this film. Because if you're someone who knows Bergman, you always just think of faces. We always see parodies of it, and it's always from Persona, but he's been doing it <laughs> for a while. Right. That's his thing. Which the, the profile and, mm -hmm. and the full face, yeah existing in the same space but they are completely in different rooms essentially 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 yeah, yeah. which i love i know it's it might ring as like too stylistic for some people which is i guess fair but i always get excited when i see like a very bergman-esque that's great like visual that. storytelling yeah yeah that's the thing. That's, that's, it's great to be known for something that uh stark and visually poignant and yeah could be worse you could be known for a lot worse so <laughs> you could be known for the uh, shots in a trunk of a car you could be known for that right <laughs> that's true <laughs> yeah 
That's what I'm saying. Do like the shots, but uh, this is uh, definitely more effective in that way. So yeah, he's a great visual storyteller. Uh, what I'll do is I'll switch to the last segment of the show then. So uh, the last segment is called End Credits, and I ask every guest the same two questions. First question is, if someone were to come up to you and say, hey, Jeff, I heard about this Bergman guy. I'd love to start watching his films. What are you going to recommend to that person? Where do they start? I think I would start with Wild Strawberries. Yeah. It's it's really relatable. It's kind of clear. It's There's some surrealism in there in terms of dreams, but it's not not unintelligible. It's it's mm-hmm. very approachable film. Yeah, I would, st- I would start with Wild Strawberries. The man who kind of just reassesses his whole life. Right? Yeah, because I do a series and I usually do four to five films. So usually my answer is the same. So I get, give it off the top. And this, this will be the first Bergman episode. So I'll say my answer is also Wild Strawberries. And I was thinking about it for a long time because I've seen, like I said, I've seen I'm at this rate, probably 90% of his stuff. And Wild Strawberries is probably not my all-time favorite although i do love it but sometimes your favorite is not the best way to start off with because your favorite might be something that you've already seen a lot of his work and you've decided that's your favorite um wild strawberries especially re-watching it because i will be covering it on the show i was like yeah i think this is the absolute best way to start because it's not as polarizing as some of his other films might be and it's not as it's still deep but it's not one where you're like i think the average film goer could understand Wild Strawberries, where they would be like, this is an older man who's reminiscing about his youth and going through his life. Whereas something like this or Persona, Cries and Whispers, even The Seventh Seal might be too much for someone to handle. And they might be like, I can't do this and I don't want to explore. And Wild Strawberries offers you everything that Bergman does. And then you could decide from there. Yeah. And and also to the point that he does dive into, or I don't want to say dive, but he does uh, film in like historical, like Seventh Seal is historical fiction. Mm-hmm. So it, it is good to start with something that was contemporary mm-hmm. within its time. I actually forgot to ask you, or I don't know if you mentioned, did you say what your first Bergman was? Seventh Seal. Okay. Yeah, that's usually the venue. That's like, I think that's probably his most well known. So that's usually what people watch on the first bet. My first one was actually Cries and Whispers, which is weird oh, wow. to start off with a color one. But like, yeah. that was so up my alley that I was like, I need to see everything. It could have gone either way where I was like, this is too much. But <laughs> Cries and Whispers was my very first one. And then I probably would have saw Seven Seal right after. Second question is a double bill question. If you're going to pair this film with another film, and you don't have to pick just one, you can pick multiple, but uh, what film would you pair it with, and why are you creating that the pairing of this this film? This is really hard to think yeah. about <laughs> for this movie because, like, you could go a whole yeah okay movie set in a hotel, movies set over 24 hours, movies mm-hmm. about sisters, movies about you know kids wandering around hotels movie it, it could go on and on and yep. on and i was like oh, well the shining was too obvious and mm-hmm. and i kept thinking of like yeah. specific scene in films not in films entirely i thought of this movie called the park by damien manivel it came out in 2016 okay. it's, it's like 70 minutes but it's kind of the inverse of this where it's a man and a woman in their early 20s who go out on a date but the, all, their, all the action takes place in a park in suburban Paris. Mm-hmm. Okay. And it's just a conversation. It, they talk about psychology. It's almost all the talk about psychology and them just getting to know each other through conversation. And eventually the guy leaves and the woman stays and she kind of uh, falls into a deep sleep. And when she wakes up, it's night in the park and she's still in the park. Mm-hmm. And this strange, these strange rumblings of like creatures in the park at night start influencing her, her psyche. And it it's a very uh, uh, strange movie. Just uh, okay. In, in I haven't heard of this one. 
Yeah, it's kind of hard to find. It was on Mubi uh, when it was okay. first released, but I looked on there and it's not there now. But I, I would double bill it with that just because it takes you outside. Okay. It's still con- they're still confined to the park, and it's still this kind of intense psychological conversation mm-hmm. that turns a bit surreal towards the end, kind of like uh, Joe, the filmmaker. Apachipan or a Sith cow. Mm, yeah. Uh, the Thai, yeah, Thai filmmaker, kind of like that. And the other choice I had to pair with it was Whatever Happened to Baby Jane? The mm. <laughs> yeah. John Crawford, Betty line. Davis movie. If the silence ends and you're kind of devastated, then this will cheer you right up. Uh, mm. <laughs> Even though it's also a little bit dark, but it's like it is there's still a, f- there's a more fun element to it. Than the silence. I'm, I'm, I'm being facetious, but it's just like it's, you know, any movie with kooky Betty Davis. Uh, yeah, is great. <laughs> yeah, I love her. Uh, Joan Crawford is Joan Crawford is one of my all time favorite actors, and I love Betty Davis as well. But that movie is masterpiece. I'm sad I didn't think about that one. Uh, but that's a, those are great pairings. Did you have any other ones? Or this is the two. Um. I think those those are those are the two I could I could really yeah pin, pin down yeah those are those are good I I I like both of those pairings and the, like the racing behind them I kind of when I sometimes depending on the film but for this one I kind of went uh, I thought of three different options but they all relate to the same sort of thematic element of you know female sexual repression thought of three different films that. You pick and choose between. So the first one was Repulsion, the Polanski mm-hmm. film, 1965. You got Katyn Tainav. It's a horror film, but the elements behind it is she's very sexually repressed. She's unable to be around women or uh, men, I should say. And that's where the fear comes in that film. And it's just a repression of why that's happened to her and what's going on with her there. So we have that. The other one I thought it was The Piano Teacher. I kind of have wow. because I love. I, he's one of my all-time favorites. I feel like I mentioned him. It's weird that I haven't covered him yet because I think almost every episode I've done, I mentioned one of his films. <laughs> so, piano teacher is one where this woman's going through some stuff and she's dealing with with it in a very not only self-destructive but overtly destructive way, and it stems from her sexual repression. So we've got mm-hmm. that one. I think I would start off with maybe Piano Teacher, maybe Silence After, because I think Piano Teacher is a lot darker than the silence. And a third one, which I would start with silence and end with, was slightly on the note, a lighter note, because it's older Hollywood, but it deals with the same thing with Splendor in the Grass with the Elia Kazan film, is Warren okay. Beatty and uh, Natalie Wood. And they're dealing with two people who, because of the time, it was like the 50s where you'd be courting each other, but you couldn't sleep together. And she really wants to sleep with Warren Beatty as anyone would. And he's like, I can't. <laughs> we have to be married first. And it, she has a full on break. A lot of people don't love that movie, but I think they're not. I don't know how to say this, but I don't know if they're viewing it in the right way. They're thinking of it as a certain way of like, oh, this seems like corny. And like, why can't she just go fuck someone else? But I'm just like, you have to understand, like, she has this thing with this man and they both have this thing. And you have to understand how it's affecting her mentally. I think it's just, it's one of my favorite Kazan films. And I think it's great. But it's, those are three different films that deal with the same sort of thematic elements of the silence. So it depends on the mood. But those would be my three suggestions. Nice. I'll have to watch Splendor in the Grass. It's good. I mean, I don't know if you like it, but most people I know are just like, this is too much for me because they just don't understand why it is that she let her need of Warren Beatty destruct her. (laughs) And I'm like, I feel like I can understand that. (laughs) (laughs) I get you. (laughs) Uh, It's. Yeah, it's an interesting watch. Whether it's it's really well made, like it's it's Elliot Kazan. I, I don't know if you're a fan of his work, but he's obviously, despite his uh, historic uh, stuff that went Traitor. on with him, yeah, mm-hmm. he's still a great <laughs> director. 
who did put out a lot of great work. Uh, I'm not trying to defend Elliot Kazan's actions, just so people who are listening <laughs> know. And out there, I'm very much against that. But I do like his work as filmmaker. That's the silence, though. I'm glad to have you on for it. I really appreciate your thoughts on it. And I'm glad that you picked it because I hadn't seen it in a long time. And I definitely appreciate it a lot more this time going around. So thank you so much for coming on, Jeff. Yeah, this is great. I'm 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 glad uh, I picked something that I'd never seen and it resonated so much. Seeing Faces and Movies is an official podcast of the Royal Film Club. It's hosted and edited by Felicia Maroney, with intro music by Lamar Walker. And if you like what you heard, let us know at seeingfacesandmovies.com or send us an email at seeingfacesandmovies at gmail.com. And while you're at it, please subscribe and rate the show wherever you listen to your podcasts. And stay tuned for our next episode on Fanny and Alexander. <laughs>